treat, which is in our season of Advent, so it's, we keep very much in mind the season of Advent and all that that means, our preparation for Christmas. But at a more personal level, our preparation for the Lord who comes to us and comes to us in many ways. <clears throat> and to help us over this weekend in our prayer, our reflection, we're going to be looking at John of the Cross's work, The Flame. This poem and commentary on the poem that John gives us. And I'm aware that, looking around the room, many of you here are very familiar with this. Others perhaps not so familiar. So what I'm going to do this evening is just give a general background to this work and uh, just general introduction to it. Then, tomorrow morning, start looking at some of the content of this work. But to begin with, and as a prayerful beginning, I'm just going to read and pray the four stanzas of this poem. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O living flame of love, that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest centre, since now you are not oppressive, now consummate, if it be your will, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. O sweet cautery, O delightful wound, O gentle hand, O delicate touch, that tastes of eternal life and pays every debt. In killing, you change death to life. O lamps of fire, in whose splendours the deep caverns of feeling, once obscure and blind, now give forth so rarely, so exquisitely, both warmth and light to their beloved. How gently and lovingly you wake in my soul, where in secret you dwell alone, and in your sweet breathing, filled with good and glory, how tenderly you swell my heart with love. Lord, we give you thanks for all that you're doing in us. And we pray that your spirit may come upon us this weekend and fill our minds and hearts with the fire and warmth of your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just listening to that poem there, one can understand why people would have asked John, to explain. One just becomes aware of the profound mysteries that are in every word in it. As we know, John is a poet, an artist. much more comfortable with symbols and imagery, 
than with rational explanations. But when John wrote his poetry and shared his poetry, people asked him to explain. And so John's teaching comes from his poetry, is an extension of his poetry. John puts the essence of the mystery into the pictures that he paints in the words of his poetry. And then his writings <clears throat> expand this, draw from it. And that's what we see particularly in this work. What is called a commentary is probably more an extension of the poem. Uh, a drawing out of some of the depths of the mystery that's there. So just to step back a little bit and so where does this fit in John's life? This po poem and this work does, doesn't just drop from the sky. When we pick up any edition of John de Cross's writings, we find that this is the last of his four great books that we find here. We get The Ascent of Mount Carmel, The Dark Knight, Spiritual Canticle, and then The Flame. And chronologically also, it is the last one of them that he wrote. And he tells us at the very beginning the words that he uses to introduce this work. He said, it's a commentary on the stanzas that treat of a very intimate and elevated union and transformation of the soul in God, written at the request of Donna Anya de Penalosa by the author of the stanzas. The author, of course, being himself. That's how he introduces it. And we see immediately here that the, that this is dedicated to Donna Anya de Mercado e Penalosa. It was more than just a dedication. I just need to probably give a little bit of the background to this woman and her relationship with John. Those of you familiar with John's writings will know that his spiritual canticle, John's most famous work and the most read and best known of John's writings, is dedicated to Mother Anne of Jesus, who was the prioress of the Carmelite convent in Granada. And he she asked him to write a commentary on those 40 stanzas that John had already written that was well known and she wrote this commentary he wrote this commentary for her in 1582 when John and Mother Anne went to Granada to make the foundation of the Carmelite convent there they got this foundation all well planned but they turned up in Granada and all the plants had fallen through and they had no house or anything. And this Anya de Penalosa y Mercada took the nuns into her house and they lived with her from January to August. So, what, nine months? Nearly nine months. The community of the Carmelite nuns led by Mother Anne lived in her house. And there began there a very close friendship with Mother Anne, but also with John de Cross, who was, had now become the prior of the Carmelite Friars, which was very nearby, and he was constantly coming to visit and support the nuns and work with them. And so John's friendship with Anna 
grew from there. She was a native of Segovia, but a few years prior to this was widowed and had moved down south to Granada to be near her brother who was a judge in that city. Years later then, when John moves back to Segovia, she'll also move back and will work with John and be the main benefactor for the building of the Carmelite monastery there, which John built. Later again, after John's death, she'll be the person who will be responsible for bringing John's body back to Segovia as burial there, where it is to today. So she's somebody who plays a very important part in John's life in various ways. This poem came about, this commentary, because obviously Mother Anne had got her commentary on the spiritual canticle in this, and yet a penulosa, and it wanted a poem for herself. It wanted her book. So she obviously pressed him, asked him to write this. And he'd written the poem, and as he puts it here in his prologue, that he felt rather reluctant. I'll just read the first line here. I felt rather reluctant, very noble and devout lady. Lovely way to address her, very noble and devout lady. But John doesn't give titles like that trivially or superficially. He really meant this. Just so. To explain these four stanzas as you asked. So obviously she's been asking him for an explanation and he's reluctant to give it. But he does, and thankfully he does, because at her request <laughs> we have here this masterpiece. But it's important for us initially to appreciate the importance of this woman here. As you know, any writer, even if they're writing, they know that this book is going to be read, and John knew this book would be read by many, many people. I'm not sure he realized we were still reading it for more than 400 years later, but he certainly would have had a very wide audience in mind. But good writers write for an individual or for a group. They have a very specific readership in mind. So John writes this in a very personal way with a specific person in mind and a person who clearly will know, I, he I reluctantly, I, I hesitate to use the word understand because clearly the material being dealt with here is not understandable but will certainly have the experience to be able to enter into this. We'll know what's being spoken about. So, in a sense, we could say that this work is a conversation, a dialogue, with a particular reader or listener, and has grown out of their relationship all that's spoken about here, they would no doubt have discussed. And many witness the amount of time she and John spent together talking about spiritual matters. So it has been refined and purified in that relationship. So it's important to keep that in mind here as we listen to this. John gives us a little prologue to this work. And I want to pick out a few things from the prologue, which again help to give us certain background and context to this. In a sense, I'm picking out three things. The first one is intimately personal to John himself. John, and those of you who are familiar with John de Cross's writings know that John rarely gives us anything autobiographical. He 
rarely if ever gives us anything that we can say is really speaking about himself. But he begins here very personally. And he tells us, since these stanzas they speak about deal with matters so interior and spiritual, for which words are usually lacking, and that the spiritual surpasses sense, I find it difficult to say something of their content. Also, one speaks badly of the intimate depths of the spirit if one does not do so with a deeply recollected soul. Because of my want of such recollection, I have deferred this commentary until now, a period in which the Lord seems to have uncovered some knowledge and bestowed some fervour. So there's a few important things there in that. He's expressing his personal reluctance to do this. In his previous work, The Spiritual Canticle, John spells out in the prologue how difficult it is to put into words what happens in the depths of the human spirit. That intimate place of converse, of relationship, of union between the person and God. It is very, very difficult to put into words what happens. It's impossible. Yet he said we have to try and do so give something. So people usually use images and illustrations and of course, John being the artist and having the mind of the artist is so good at doing this. So it is very, and so here now he has written these four stanzas, very difficult to give any sort of explanation. <coughs> but to give an explanation requires not just to have the right words and the right imagery, would also, he said, needs a recollected soul. Inner light coming from within. And he said he doesn't have that. And that's perhaps pretty consoling for us to think that John the Cross himself, John certainly wasn't walking around in some kind of ecstasy or <laughs> anything like that or wonderful recollection. Most of the time, he certainly wasn't. But somehow, he comes to some point here where he has some bit of fervor or light and feels ready to do this. Up until now, he just didn't feel in the right place spiritually to take on this work. His companion and secretary, when he was writing this work, Juan Evangelista, tells us, Gail left a testimony, that the other writings, because he said he was with John when he wrote the, his four books. He was sort of acting as his secretary and assistant and companion. And the other books, he said, John wrote little by little over a long period of time in the midst of many other works and occupations. When he came to the living flame, he wrote it, the commentary now in 14 days. While he was provincial, and he said, in the midst of many other occupations. So while John wrote this work in only 14 days, there were very, very busy 14 days with many, many other things. But somehow he seemed to have that spirit, that inner spirit to rise.